here we are. Um, hopefully this will be a little bit better. Um, so in this week's stuff, we see some very interesting concepts. One concept that we saw was called the Davar Sheyeshlo Matirin. This is found in Da 58. This is a really interesting concept that is all about nullifying uh, mixtures, nullifying mixtures. So uh, if you uh, drop a, 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 a little drop of milk in your chicken soup, you can nullify that mixture in what ratio? Anybody know this concept in Kashrut where you have a... One to 60. One to 60, Howard. Amazing, right? Well, on this DAF, on DAF 58, we learn that actually it's not true that it's one to 60 for all things. We learn actually that in some cases it's one to 100. In other cases, it's one to 1,000. And in still other cases, and this is what we focused on on the DAF, it's never. You can never nullify certain objects in a mixture. Now, one of the things that you can never nullify in, an, in a mixture is called a DAF. An item that will become eventually permitted. Now, a classic thing um, in this category is chametz, right? Chametz on Pesach. Um, bread is permitted most of the time, except on Pesach, that's called a davar sheyesh matirin, and it will become permitted again on the other end, and therefore it will never become nullified in a mixture. That's why we're so wild about cleaning for Passover, because ultimately, uh, we can't say, ah, it's just a little bit, right? Uh, we can for other things. Uh, we also talked about things like Truma, right? That Kohanic gift uh, as part of our produce. Maybe that is an item that is a Davar Sheyesh Lometri. And we talked about all of these things. Um, here was another fun thing we discussed this week. Shmita sabbatical year onions. Raise your hand if you like onions. You like onions? Okay. All right. Well, you must have enjoyed the DAF then this week because we talked about onions for three consecutive days. Um, here's what we were discussing. I'm imagining um, who should I call on? Well, Howard said the answer before, so I'm going to call on Howard. So let's say Howard makes a vow to never benefit from a particular onion and he's holding that onion in his hand. And then um, Howard's friend plants that onion and it grows another onion the next year. The question was, does the new growth nullify the original growth of Howard's forbidden onion. And we had a whole back and forth, a lengthy detour to figure out the rules for whether or not the new growth uh, nullifies Howard's uh, an initial uh, vow. And that was a very interesting uh, back and forth. Another theme that came up on this week's staff was very important. There's an idea that Rabbi Natan holds that making vows is like building an altar outside of the temple where it is forbidden. And annulling vows is also a mitzvah because ultimately we are not supposed to even make them in the first place. So if you keep a vow, it's like offering a sacrifice at an altar that is not in an appropriate place. So this is a, a one time in, in our daf where we got, kind of get shaken and we're told, I know we're giving you all these laws of making vows. Here's the bottom line. Don't do it. Just don't do it. And in fact, if you do, you got to go annul it. It's a mitzvah, according to Rabbi Natan, to go annul this vow. It's interesting to consider, and I would love to see in the chat um, if you have any thoughts about what's so bad, right? What's so bad about making a nether? What's so bad about this? Um, one approach, which I think is pretty compelling, is the idea that God, the Torah, has the power to make things forbidden and permitted. But it's kind of like a show of religious arrogance to say, no, no, no. I know what's permitted and forbidden. And so I'm going to make things around this world forbidden and permitted and all these things. I'm I'm kind of like God, right? So that's one, one approach. And I would love to see in the chat any other approaches uh, that you think. Why might Rabbi Natan be so, so upset about this concept of making a vow in the first place? Next piece that we learned, and I'm just flying through the daf here, daf 60. Okay, good, good. Thanks, Chazan Leia, right? Um, we talked about how long a vow lasts. Um, what is the standard amount of time 
where we say, we make a vow, how long does it last? So we talked about, does time work from hour to hour, from week to week? Um, and that was uh, the discussion on DAF 60, which is interesting. DAF 61, we, we saw, I feel like, Rob, I don't know if this was you who put it in the chat when we were learning it in our daily DAF Yomi class, but someone said, dad of the year, dad of the year. We learned about the dad of the year who actually did not remember who, which daughter he betrothed off to someone and then made a neder uh, against his daughter marrying someone else. So this was really weird, um, this idea that it wasn't clear which daughter uh, that he betrothed off to someone. Um, but ultimately, this particular piece of Talmud concludes that when it comes to a vow which has a fixed time and one says that the vow applies until before the event, Rabbi Meir said that it applies until the event ends. And Rabbi Yosei says that it's only until the event arrives. That was the conclusion there. And beautiful. I see explanations in the chat uh, just flying for why it is that a vow might be a problem in the first place. Uh, Pamela says our words have power, right? We need to be mindful. So actually, we can conclude this whole tractate and basically become really, really aware of our words. And that would be the correct takeaway, right? According to Pamela, um, beautiful Michael Stock says, breaking a vow is similar to uh, using God's name in vain, which is one of the 10 commandments, building a fence, yifta, right? Beautiful, beautiful comments. Um, okay, DAF 62, this was an interesting one. Let's say, uh, who do I want to call in? Oh, Cheryl, let's say Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl, uh, nice to see you. So let's say Cheryl gets up and she says, I vow not to eat apples until the harvest ends. Okay, now, um, I don't know if Cheryl is familiar with harvest season, but not everybody has the same one, right? And it's not exactly clear when the harvest ends. And there was a suggestion that the harvest ends when knives have been set aside. They're folded up and they're put away. That's when the harvest ends. Ad bismanche hukpulu rov hamaktua, when everyone puts away their harvesting tools. Uh, so that was really interesting because we saw some fun stories about how if you find a fig, after the harvest officially ends, what are you allowed to do? If you find a, a fig on a tree after the fig harvest ends, everyone puts away their knives. What are you allowed to do? Nothing. Yeah, you can have a fig snack. You can eat. You can eat it. We assume that the uh, the owner of the field has has left it out there. It's ownerless for you. Um, we took a small detour to talk about a Torah scholar who uses Torah knowledge for their own gain, which was not appropriate. Um, we saw a dramatic story of poor Rabbi Tarfon. Anyone remember what happened to him? So he was eating some figs that looked abandoned and then he got thrown into a sack by the owner of the field and dragged to the river <laughs> to be drowned there. And we talked about uh, how he actually saved himself by saying, excuse me, sir, I'm a scholar, right? So was this an appropriate thing to do when he could have actually paid off the guy instead? So we had two conflicting values here, right? So was it better to pay this the guy off or was it better for him to use his status as a Torah scholar to get out of this situation? Um, so that was very interesting, a little aside, because we don't usually think about the importance of um, modesty in that way. Like it was so, so important for him not to do that, uh, that even he should have given lots of money instead uh, in order to get out of that situation. Okay. DAF 63, moving right along and feel free also to put questions in the chat um, or puns. As you can see, Rob Plass has begun the process of punning in the chat as well. Um, okay. So what happens when, um, who's up? Let's see. Let's say uh, Erica. Erica has a vow, right? She makes a vow. I'm never going to eat garlic um, it, this year, right? I'm not going to have garlic this year. And then it turned out that the great assembly met and it turned out that that year had an extra adar, right? It had a, it was a leap year. So the question is, um, Erica like calls calls Mara on her cell phone and she says, you know, what do I do here? Like, what's the year? What exactly is the year? Because now there's an extra month in the year. And we get into this whole discussion of Adar, Aleph, and Bet. Adar one and two. And when you have an extra Adar in the year, 
when is the real Adar? Will the real Adar please stand up, right? Will the real Adar please stand up? And there's a debate in the halachic commentaries about which one is the real one, right? Which is the month that actually we observe most things on. Uh, So some interesting notes about that. Uh, We do observe all of the commandments of Purim in Adar 2, right? Adar 2. The reason is because it is adjacent, it is close to Passover. Um, And we want to connect the feelings uh, or the spark of redemption that we feel on Purim to Passover. But there's a whole debate about if you have a loved one who dies in the month of Adar, which month you keep the yurt site, the death anniversary. Where, where do you keep it? Is it under one or under two? And there are opinions actually that go in both directions, um, which is very interesting. And ultimately, I said this in, in my class the other day, but experientially, if a person has died around Purim, it's a little strange. It feels a little strange to observe a, a yard site uh, and say Kaddish, not near Purim at all, right? So experientially, it can be a little strange. So um, often folks chose choose uh, the halachic approach to do the second Adar uh, for their yard site observance, though there are other opinions uh, that say in the opposite direction. Okay, um, let's see what else. Uh, today and yesterday, we talked about grounds for a annulment of vows, grounds for annulment of vows, and also the idea of making a vow that was so mistaken to begin with, it gets automatically canceled, right? So what are some grounds for the annulment of vows? Well, we talked yesterday about if you had made a vow that goes directly against being able to honor your parents, you have to provide your parents with uh, physical support, if they need it. And so what what does it mean if you make a vow that they should never benefit from you? Well, you could go to the sage and you can say, excuse me, um, I don't think I would have made this vow if I would have known that I would have gone against what I was supposed to do for my parents. If that's true, then that would be grounds for annulment. Similarly, we talked about a very interesting situation that uh, what if the person or the sage says to you, Would you have made this vow if you would have known that making the vow would be a disgrace to God's name? (laughs) Would you have done this? And we talked about, well, if that's the case, there's no such thing as Nadarim anymore, right? Because every vow in some way is a disgrace uh, to Hashem's name, to God's name. So we talked a little bit about that on yesterday's daf. On today's daf, we talked about uh, the idea of making a vow and some new information coming to light in the interim between your making the vow and wanting to act on this vow. We talked about, this was a very uh, interesting situation. We talked about it. What happens if someone says, I am never entering this house? This house is konam to me, right? Um, never right entering this house. And then what happens? the house turns into a synagogue, right? So the person really wants to go into the house. What's the situation? Is that grounds for annulment when something would, uh, new information would come to light? We learn actually that if you vow and it was highly improbable that this change would occur, then it is no lot. It's considered to be something like that uh, changed, uh, developed in the process and the vow doesn't work. But there's a debate about how improbable the issue has to be. Okay. Um, We also talked about uh, a serious error in the vow. Like, let's say you say, I'm I'm never going to benefit or I'm never going to marry this woman uh, because she's short. Right. And then actually it turns out she's like six one. Right. So that there you have a situation where the, the vow is automatically canceled. So just a theme I want to pull out for us here is there's a difference between a vow that is automatically canceled because it is mistaken. It is based on a mistaken premise and a vow that you have to go to a sage to seek annulment for that vow. Which one do you think is more common? a vow that is automatically canceled or one that you have to petition a sage for? What do you think is more common? Yeah, you can unmute and say, if you wanna hop in. Yeah, Chazan Leia, what do you think? Yeah, logically it would be the petitionary one because it involves an awful lot of extra work and thought. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you're right. It is much more common for the process to be as follows. Make a vow, realize that the vow was foolish, go to a sage and petition and find grounds for an opening and have that vow be annulled. That's that's the most common thing. And that might even happen on a yearly basis, right? We talked about Hatarat Nidarim, the annulment of vows before Rosh Hashanah, or of course, Kol Nidre, right? Um, so that's that's a common thing. It's less common for the vow to be so absurd that actually it is automatically canceled. And like Chazan Laya said, it's it's also a deterrent to put into place the idea that you would have to go to a sage uh, to get it annulled. Now, finally, this was a delight. Uh, we had two stories, one on yesterday's death about Moshe's vow, Moses's vow uh, not to return to Egypt, um, to Yitro, to Jethro, and we talked about what the what the laws were that we learned about how he was able to annul that, it's really an oath, how he was able to go ahead and annul it. And on today's daf, we have a fascinating situation of Nebuchadnezzar, the evil ruler, uh, was eating a live bunny rabbit. Um, and we saw a story today about how uh, he was uh, betrayed by Tzidkiyahu. Uh, and ultimately, he was able to break his vow and, and tell everybody that Nebuchadnezzar was eating a rabbit. Um, but uh, Nebuchadnezzar actually figured out a way that he shouldn't have broken the vow. So this is really interesting that we saw on today's stuff. Um, there's a lot of back and forth about what exactly eating the rabbit symbolizes. But an interesting uh, theme that we might want to think about is what is Nebuchadnezzar, this evil ruler, doing in the context of teaching us law about observing vows and annulling vows? Why is this guy teaching us a uh, halacha? Yeah, Laura says, interesting that Nebuchadnezzar knew Talmud, right? Um, so you can think about why why that is. You can just chew on it now or put it in the chat. Like, why why do you think there's this villain in our history who's coming and teaching us halacha, teaching us how to understand the laws of vow making. Um, yes, and Saul asks in the chat, who determines that it is absurd? What a good question. Um, so we're seeing the laws outlined here in Tractate Nadarim of what, what it means for a vow to be so mistaken that it can automatically be canceled. But here's the problem. Since vows are made by a person that person, unless they care about observing the Torah, might just never do anything about it, right? That's their choice. The only thing is that if a person made a vow and is a God-fearing person and wants to make sure they're not violating a biblical commandment, they're going to want to know how it is that to get out of that vow. And in most situations, uh, they will end up at a sage anyway. They will end up in front of a panel of, of uh, judges anyway, and the judges will either try to find them an opening, find them grounds for annulment, or they'll say, sir, your vow is automatically annulled, right? So they'll do one of those two things. Um, but something I was thinking about is, you know, you have rabbinical schools today, right? And then you have rabbinic training back during this time involved trying to understand or training as a, as a sage, trying to understand how to interact with people who make statements out of anger or other kinds of impassioned emotion and how to actually help them understand what was wrong about that and repent, right? And say, actually, I'm looking for grounds for annulment. So this was a type of rabbinic interaction that was, it's not here anymore. We don't do this exactly. Um, maybe a little bit echoes, but this is just an interesting thing. Um, okay, I'm going to look at the chat. Uh, drowning seems pretty extreme for eating figs. Strong agree, Aaron Boxer. Yeah. Um, doo -doo -doo, good puns. Add on to Adar. Yes, yes. Um, okay, good. I'm just continuing to look. So wedding vows. Interesting. Um, we need to be making a Venn diagram, actually, between three different Jewish concepts. We have a vow which is a neder, we have an oath, a shavua, and then you have a legal contract, which is actually what we have 
for the realm of weddings. Um, we don't actually make a neder, a vow, when it comes to weddings, even though in English, um, that's kind of the word that we have in American culture, as we say, we say vow. Um, but it's interesting, each of those things have very different connotations. So a vow is when you say, this item is off limits to me, for permitted or forbidden items. An item becomes like a something that, that has been sanctified to the temple and therefore off limits. An oath is something that you bring upon yourself about experiences or like, for example, the one that we saw about Moses, I'm never going to go back to Egypt, right? That is a, an experience uh, that he makes an oath about. But a contract is something else completely, right? And the wedding, while it has elements of sanctity, it's ultimately a legal contract that has financial obligations for both parties. So that's a really interesting uh, question. Um Okay, and that's relating also to why vows are always stated negatively. Um, vows are basically setting something off limits. So I have this book here. So this book, a vow would be setting this book off limits um, and uh, or setting a building off limits. Ultimately, you're, you're sanctifying that object in a way that gives it like a green glow and you can't go near it anymore. An oath would be different. An oath could be like, uh, I'm not going to go down to... Jerusalem anymore. I don't know, whatever it is, uh, we're going to have a whole opportunity to learn a tractate about oaths in addition to vows. Um, okay, just looking down here, rabbi is not paid uh, for annulling a vow. This was their job as part of their Torah learning and Talmud study. So all of these dafs that we're seeing around um, supporting Torah scholars financially, this is related, right? No, they're not paid for the service, but also we support it's like a communal activity to support Torah scholars. Um, yeah, could we connect it to resolutions? Certainly, right? Um, if if we like created a, a system where people were actually making nidarim, right? Actually making real vows at New Year's, then that, that would be uh, connected for sure. Um, one area in which this really applies, raise your hand if you got a year end giving email in the last three days year-end giving email, right? This organization wants your money and that organization wants your money. My Jewish learning wants your money, right? All I do, right? So whatever. The idea here is something that's interesting is that uh, tzedakah, pledging money to charity is a type of vow. So if you say out loud to your partner, whatever it is, uh, yeah, let's give $100 to fill in the blank organization, um, that's a vow, actually. Um, you've you've dedicated money to charity and you have to give that money unless you do hatarat nedarim, unless you, um, before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, you actually annul that vow, right? So that's just an interesting related to this time of year, uh, a halacha. Okay, uh, looking down the list here, eating a live rabbit is against the, yeah, it's totally, it's not a good thing. It's very a villainous activity. Um, yes. So know thy enemy, da, 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 God's servant. Good point. Sorry, I'm just looking down the chat. Mm -hmm. Amazing. These are great, great comments. Um, pledging money is not an oath. That's that's a good point. Good question. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I don't. I, I want to actually wait until we get to some of those stuffs, those pages in uh, Shavuot when we get to that uh, tractate to to try to make some clarity about how we rule it today. Um, we are just getting to the end of our time today. Um, what something I just encourage you to look at on today's DAF, there's a series of really beautiful verses that are quoted for why you shouldn't make vows against folks, because actually you might need to support them in the future. Um, and so why would you make an oath, uh, excuse me, a vow not to support a person when in the future they might need you? And then we have all these verses to that effect, including kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. Just a beautiful reminder that vow making might put you in a situation where you can't actually perform a relational mitzvah in a way that you really, really want to. So with that, I will say have a wonderful Shabbat, wonderful rest of your week. And Mara, do you want to close us out? Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Rabbi Dasi. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Good job to everyone. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Shabbat Shalom.